Hello there, my name's Josh, I'm a Canadian video producer, and today we're going to be looking at all the elements from the Netflix exclusive documentary, White Hot, The Rise of Abercrombie & Fitch. You know that you're getting close when you're hit with the smell of Abercrombie. White Hot, The Rise of Abercrombie & Fitch is a Netflix exclusive documentary recounting the success and eventual controversy and decline of the popular American clothing brand Abercrombie & Fitch. The film combines traditional on-camera interviews with tongue-in-cheek animations and other charmingly dated visuals to paint a picture of a misguided company shrouded in discriminatory business practices. When this documentary originally came out, it had a polarizing graphical style which caused a lot of people to say they loved it and caused a lot of people to say it was distracting. With that being said, let's take a look at all of the visual elements in White Hot, The Rise of Amber Crombie and Fitch. They didn't invent class. They just packaged it. We're going to start with the traditional interviews, which are what make up the bulk of the documentary. Each subject is shot in a wide, and then they have a corresponding mid or close shot. The primary use of these two shots is to go back and forth between them, so you can increase the brevity and the speed of the story, and rearrange clips as needed. It also offers visually something different to look at if you're going back and forth between two shots, as opposed to holding on one. One thing I will say about the way the traditional interviews are shot in this documentary is that they're very trendy. I don't know if they're going to hold up long term visually. I think it was the Fire Festival documentary that I originally saw, which for me established the directly into the camera wide room shot as being a staple of a Netflix production. You just see everything and it's very invasive for the subject, but it's also very personal with your connection being directly into the eyes of the subject. So if we look at this shot of Jose Sanchez right here, it's nicely done. And right off the bat, you can tell it's shot at a really low aperture because you have the blurred background in the back. Standard key light, which is just coming towards his face. And then we have some sort of fill lighting up the dark side of his face so it's not too dark. We have the catch lights in his eyes, which at this point are a little overwhelming. There's a lot of little catch lights in his eyes, so I don't know, maybe I would have changed that, but it looks overall very nice. And the animated super title, which is what introduces him in the bottom, just comes in with a standard typewriter effect. Take a look at one of our wide shot examples. We have our subject on a couch here, and this is what I meant about that entire room wide framing that the Netflix producers like to do. For this stuff, I'm all for it. It adds a vulnerability to the subject, which, I mean, if they are part of a documentary where a company was victimizing people, it definitely adds to what they're trying to say. Overall, I think the many traditional interviews in this documentary run the gamut from good to could be better. For example, there's this one interview which I swear is just wildly underexposed. And you know what? This next one coming up, I'm just gonna show you. It's not technically, a I, can't e I can't even look at it. It throws me because he's off center. It's bizarre. He's not like right in the center and then he's like, I don't know, right on the, the lower third line as well. The rest of them are perfectly serviceable and I think do a good job of framing the subject to tell the story that they need to tell. Next, I'd like to move to a very similar set of elements for this documentary. These I'm going to call beauty interviews because they're shot with a diffusion filter, which gives everything a hazy, misty look. This hazy, misty look is often used in beauty photography to soften up a subject's wrinkles or make them look generally smoother than they would. And it definitely does have that effect. I mean, look at the bloom coming off of this chandelier here. That's a really shitty way to draw that. Um, everything looks super blown out and dreamlike. I don't really see any reason uh, that we need to shoot them in this way other than the fact that this woman happens to be in a more sultry type of environment. It is interesting though and it does provide a little more production value in what otherwise would have been just another interview shot. All right, so let's talk about the big thing people will remember when they think visually of this documentary, and that is the graphical interludes. When I was judging people's reactions on this documentary and reading reviews, of course the story made a big impact on people, but a lot of people also wanted to make comments about the graphical interludes. These poppy stylistic edits, some people really liked as part of the show, and other people thought they were a bit over the top and unnecessary. Myself, personally, I fall on the side of actually really liking them because they follow a certain beat within the story. Early on, on in the documentary, they described that a common thing that teenagers would do with the magazines of Abercrombie & Fitch is they would cut out the models and put them up in their room. This style of cut out and paste editing for some of the graphical montages makes for a really interesting tie into the story. And practically, it's actually not that hard of a thing to do. 
If we look at this title screen right here, all we see is a bunch of different layers. What they do is they put a motion in it and a move on these different effects and it comes together and it looks really nice. It kind of like a, like a faux amateurish design. It really does establish a good connection to the old school magazine cutting out that they're talking about in the documentary. And I, because of that, I think it's well done. So for this one, they're talking about the early 1990s. And again, they just have their blue background. They've got some interesting like titles within these borders and then they just cut out whatever. It's a really cost effective way to communicate these ideas. So from a production standpoint, they've done their job in saving money and potentially, you know, making an efficient product. And on the creative side, they fulfilled those obligations by connecting it to the story and making it look interesting for the viewer. But the way they bring static objects to life. So where other documentaries would just put a picture of someone white hot puts a little more creative flair into it. They cut them out and then they put the little jiggle onto the characters, the little wiggle, which brings them to life. It's almost like a photo to video type manipulation. It's interesting. It's stylistic and it's a fun take on this particular style of animation. Now we move on to perhaps the most charming part of the production, which is the use of miniatures. I gotta be honest with you guys, when I saw that they were using miniatures for a small part of the documentary, my heart just skipped a beat. I love miniatures. And it's interesting because they don't call attention to the fact that they're miniatures. It's almost like they're trying to hide it. Like they show the doors of an Abercrombie and Fitch location. They walk through some of the employees and they even have some cool smoke and lighting effects. And you can just tell that they're miniatures because of the perspective and the way that they react to the elements in the scene. I swear to God, they even do this little rack focus on one of the miniatures that's just, it's just so cute, God damn it. But what they do accomplish is that they provide an increased level of production value and visual variety to the film, which I wasn't expecting from this documentary. They're only in a film for a brief moment, but they do add some charm to the production. The next element we're going to talk about briefly, and I mean briefly because it barely shows up in the documentary. Occasionally we have our subjects, mostly the ex-models that they interview, posing in front of a photography backdrop. They do this like candid style photo shoot. I say photo shoot, but it's not really a photo shoot. Like they're just, they're recording them, but that th we never see that angle either. Like it's just like a prop. And in that way, that's like a super expensive prop that they just, they use the camera guy and the camera as a prop. It's interesting. I take that the reason they're doing this is one, they needed some introductory B-roll and they potentially only had the location and the time of the person for that day. It does have a small callback to their role with the company previously, so that's something. It does feel a little out of place though. I mean, you could just see it's hastily set up. You have like the C stands and then like, I don't know, like this really hideous blue backdrop behind. Uh, like it's fine. You can see that it's like in the location that they were filming though. These are used sparingly through the documentary, so I'm not taken aback too much by them, but they are a little confusing for me. Next, I want to talk about White Hot's title cards. So title cards or intertiles in film are inserts of text which the audience is supposed to read. Typically, these are very straightforward and they're usually placed on a static or relatively unbusy background just for the purpose of clarity. White Hot displays some pretty interesting looking title cards. What it is, is it's just some simple font on this black film grain background and the gritty color of the black, the background of the title card, does add a certain drama that the other scenes don't have. Like this large black foreboding background does help communicate the gravity of the text, especially in this one where they're talking about the results of a court case. I think for a documentary that really flourishes in its graphical style, they showed surprising restraint in the development of these cards, and I like that in this documentary. Another element that this documentary utilizes, which a lot of documentaries utilize, is archival footage. So the archival footage in this documentary ranges the gamut from historical footage of old stores to old commercials to being modern enough to include social media snippets and little videos shot on old phones. They portray this information to you in a variety of ways. Sometimes they just play it outright in terms of a video. Sometimes they put the video inside a graphical box or some sort of like creative framing to make it more interesting. Like if we look at this one here, we have what could be early smartphone footage. I, I don't know what uh, time this was taken, but it's just put inside a box essentially is what it is. They've used a clipping mask to put it inside a box. And then they've added this design, which is breaking down a pair of pants and where the measurements and the seams should be. And that's more interesting than just playing the footage. 
The next element I wanted to differentiate from the graphical interludes, and I just wanted to call this one more text explainers. White Hot uses this animated text explainer to convey information to you that is particularly important for you as a viewer to absorb. So not as fast paced as the montage graphical style. One interesting part is when they're describing what an Abercrombie and Fitch worker should look like, they do this binder effect where the whole frame keeps moving and there's no cuts. The text appears, you get a chance to read it, and then they move on. Effects like that allow you to combine the text information you need to convey to your viewers with the visual information to help support that text. There's also times where they need to bolden the text by highlighting it in a newsprint. These are important things to think of as a producer and an editor because ultimately it helps to support the point you want to make in your film. So that was a breakdown of all of the visual elements in White Hot, The Rise of Abercrombie and Fitch. What did you think of the film? Let me know in the comments below.